Hello and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where we focus on the people part of your business. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. And today's guest is pretty interesting, pretty technical guy. You'll, you'll get it when I tell you the background. Then he switches sides and starts a company, and he's leading the company as CEO. So he's gone from the tech side to the business side. I'm guessing he'll say he's still both. But... He is building one of San Francisco's fastest growing tech companies, and we're going to talk about Transposite, but we're really going to focus on how he is building the team. It's about a 15-person team in San Francisco, and he's going to walk us through what he's learned along the way of building that team. So his name is Adam Leventhal, and Adam was the CTO, the chief technology officer at a company called Delphix, did that for a few years, went into venture capital for a while, became fascinated with this concept, and started transposit back in 2016 so he's been at it for what coming up in about two and a half years now transposit i'm gonna let him describe what the business does but in 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 basic terms as i understand it this is an api related company that really allows developers to much more easily and quickly build apps but i'll let him tell you about that and then we'll get into the team so with all that welcome adam jeff thanks for having me Great to have you on the show. Thank you for making the time. So why don't we start with just the business? Like I said, in layman's terms, if someone has no idea what the heck an API is, let's say you're you're talking to my mom, how would you describe what Transposit does? Great. Well, uh, we've seen this big shift in software, both uh, from consumers and from the enterprise. And this shift has been from stuff that runs in systems that we control, like on-premises, on our own computers, into the cloud. The cloud is kind of this buzzword concept, but you know, in its essence, it's moving things from your own data center or your own house or your own building into someone else's data center house or building and then accessing it over the internet. So that's changed a lot of things. And in particular, it's changed the way that people build the applications that customize their business. So, you know, we say that every company is becoming a tech company. And really what that means is they're building their own software. Uh, not from scratch, but integrating with all these different big SaaS vendors, all these big cloud application vendors. And that's where your business lives is at that integration point, right? Exactly. As people are building those integrations, as people are building those applications that customize what they do as a business, they're using Transposit to make it a lot easier. So APIs are the way they access it, and we make it a lot easier for developers, for software engineers to uh, access those APIs. So let's use a, a quick example. You don't have to name names if you don't want, but what's a type of customer that would use the Transposite product? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of excitement around uh, building bots for Slack or things for like Alexa or Google Home or all those kinds of interactivities where you want to say, plug your chat bot or your, your speech controlled bot into something else you care about, like uh-huh. your Google Calendar or Salesforce or some other utility. So we make it a lot easier to build that glue that holds it all together. Got it. So if I want to build a new skill for an Alexa, Amazon Alexa, your product would help me make those integrations. Exactly right. So there's a bunch of pain in the neck associated with connecting those APIs. We we, uh, take care of that for you. So you get to cut right to the interesting and complicated, the the things that are are really unique to your business. One of the things I loved about your your messaging around the company is that you let developers focus on the fun uh, right. and not the tedium, which I think is really interesting, right? I, I've had developers work for me before and they love that kind of stuff, right? If you can really take out all the garbage tedium, they love what they do and they can produce some amazing things. That's exactly right. Yeah. Developers are, their lives have gotten kind of interesting in that they're so much more powerful with all these connections that they can forge, but it's more of a pain in the neck because uh, all the overhead associated with it. So we're trying to give them the power and we'll take care of the stuff that's kind of a pain. Got it. Now you've built the team up to what, 15, 16 people you said? That's right. Got it. And where, where specifically are they located? So uh, we're all in downtown San Francisco, right on Market Street. Um, almost everyone is in the office, uh, you know, four or five days a week with one ro- remote employee. Got it. So you're ground zero of, of the tech revolution. And, exactly. and you've raised money from investors, I suppose, to start the company? Yeah. So we raised uh, a seed round a couple of years ago. And then uh, late last year, we raised our Series A. Got it. And so when you think about the decisions, let's shift to the people part of the business. When you had this idea, right? Yeah. You started the company, you raised some money. Now you had to lay out the talent strategy, right? Who am I going to hire? Where am I going to hire them? How are we going to work? 
how did, first of all, how did you know how to do that? And then second of all, what were some of the key considerations that you made in designing the team the way you did? Yeah. So, uh, first, how did I know how to do that? Well, um, you know, I've been involved with recruiting pretty much since I was first a, a very junior engineer at Sun Microsystems working in the Solaris kernel group. Uh, I remember I showed up in August and by about September, October, I'd gone back to my alma mater to recruit uh, you know, the folks I had been uh, TAing, you know, the uh, few months before that. So crazy. Yeah. I started, yeah. I started recruiting basically the instant I, I joined the industry. Um, so, uh, you know, before I was at Delphix as CTO, you said I, I, you know, I was involved in recruiting for small and large teams at Sun. And then when I became CTO, a big part of my challenge uh, at Delphix when I joined was to expand the team and grow the team in terms of its quality and capability. So, um, you know, I had enough uh, of that experience to feel like it was the type of challenge that I could take on. And one of the reasons I joined that previous startup was to gain that experience to feel confident knowing uh, that I could start my own thing and understand, you know, sort of how the, the sausage was made. I'm assuming a good chunk of the, of the team are developers or engineers. Yeah, so our focus, uh, you know, early on was exclusively engineering. We've since, you know, because when you start a company, the first thing you need to build is the product. Yeah, and sure. uh, the founders have that product sense in almost every company. So, uh, you know, uh, sales are, aren't really relevant until you have something to sell. Uh, product management becomes more important as the, as the founders are less able to, like, fill that role. Uh, you know, marketing, and you need something to feed the sales engine. So, really, it's just about building that initial product. And are you at that point where you're starting to add those other functions or is this team pretty much all still developers? So it's still mostly developers, but we've since uh, expanded in marketing uh, a couple of different types of marketing roles. Okay. But uh, the bulk of the team is, is engineers. So one of the most common questions I get from listeners is particularly around hiring software developers. How do you think about and how much do you weigh the non-technical aspect, the non-skills. So you could call it culture fit or DNA or match personality, whatever you want to call it. So you know, some people will argue who cares <laughs> and yeah. others will argue that it's even more important than the skills. So yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm, much more, I'm much more on the latter half. So it, you know, part of my um, undergraduate experience kind of rolling all the way back, I won't specifically name the dates, but part of my undergraduate experience was as a teaching assistant. And I think that uh, my, my university, Brown University Computer Science, has a really strong teaching assistant program where undergraduates are teaching other undergraduates. And the thing that that encoded in me and, and my peers at that time was the value of collaboration, the value of being able to take the thing that's in my head and imbuing it into someone else's head. And that's not what people would call necessarily a, a strictly technical skill, but I think uh, I learned very early that that's incredibly valuable. That, it's that's the only way you can It's a teaching that. skill and communication skill, right? Exactly. It's a teaching skill. It's a listening skill. It's a way of adapting uh, the way that you're communicating to, to the party that you're trying to get to understand. And that's the only way you get any leverage is by, uh, you know, otherwise you're just as powerful as what you can do with your own two hands. And would you call that emotional intelligence or what do you call that? Certainly there's an aspect to that. Um, but I think you can still have, so, yeah, I, I think that emotional intelligence um, has some other stuff uh, or, or kind of connotations wrapped up in it. So, you know, I think that you can still, there's this archetype of the engineer as the loner, as the, the person head down who doesn't want to communicate. And certainly I think that that's quite extreme. Um, but you can have people for whom uh, communication is, is challenging and, and it's a skill that they develop. You can have people for whom, who are really introverts and would rather kind of stick their self, but still understand the value and, and, and have, have flexed that muscle of communication. So when it comes to that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so the, the, the values and the style of the organization need to have enough flexibility, right, to flex, yeah. to accommodate different styles. Yeah, each person should should grow the team culture in some way. You know, some, some folks talk about preserving culture and finding culture fit. Uh, I, I, don't really, I don't really ascribe to that philosophy. I think that each person you bring in is not going to fit into the culture. They're going to grow the culture in some way, and you want to grow it in, in thoughtful and positive ways with, with each candidate you bring in. So you've hired a lot of developers over the years, not just in this role, but previously. What have you learned about how to assess for that? I understand how you assess for technical skills, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. How that, do you that, assess for those softer skills? Do you do it in interviews or some other way? 
Yeah, so, so one thing I just say, I don't necessarily think of those as softer skills necessarily, because e even as you're evaluating technical talent, there's one part which is really cut and dry, uh, where you can almost think of it like math problems, like it works or it doesn't. But I think so much of software engineering is more nuanced than that. You know, what, what do I think is well-structured code might be different than what you think is well-structured code. Yep. And already you've, diver you've diverged from something that is really metric-based or decisive into something that has some more opinion and subjectivity from it. And, and then it kind of goes from there. One thing I'd also say on this topic is, you know, my last role at, at Delphix, we grew the team from about 10 engineers when I joined to about 120 when I left between development, QA, support, and a bunch of different roles. Um, the thing that was really important for us was defining the characteristics that we're interviewing for. Before that, we'd get people showing up to interview roundtables saying stuff like, oh, they were a bad culture fit, yeah. or you know, they didn't take hints well. It's like, well, what do you mean by a bad culture yeah, it's fit? Yeah, it's, it's not specific enough, right? It's not specific enough, and it's too much, it can be too much of a stand-in for our own biases. For the, you know, we like the people who are kind of like us, who have similar backgrounds, who talk like us, who think like us. So let's get more specific. Is it that they weren't able to communicate and you couldn't get on the same page? Or was it that you, know, you didn't like their answer, but it was just as valid? So helping people understand the criteria with which they're, for which they're interviewing helps shape the way that people bring feedback into those interview panels and get much more concrete in a way that other people can evaluate. If you tell me that someone was a bad culture fit, I have no way of digging into that. Yeah. I don't know what to do with that. It's just like if someone says, I really liked him. I don't know what to do with that. That's not useful. Right. Tell me more. Let's, let's get it onto values that we agree on. And that helps guide those conversations. So now you hire the individual. She's a great software developer. You hire her and you realize there is a culture disconnect. There's a DNA disconnect. You missed it somehow. Right. No yeah. one's perfect. What do you do? How do you deal with it? When do you deal with it? Can it be changed and turned around at all? Yeah, that's a, a great one. And I've, I've had, you know, uh, yeses and nos in the past in my career. Uh, sometimes you find folks where there is just a, a deep incompatibility that is hard to figure out how to resolve. I, I had one, uh, you know, former colleague in particular where um, we had a real culture. We, we had in my last company, we have in this country, a real, real culture of pragmatism. That is to say, we're not just going to pick up shiny objects and new technologies for the sake of being new. We want to be driven and focused on delivering value for customers. Yep. So, uh, and this person just couldn't get their head around that concept and kept on gravitating towards the new and shiny. So ultimately that person didn't work out. We needed to terminate them. And actually I got an email from them not that long ago thanking me for that, which was a, a kind of a bizarre. Tell me more about that. When you say thank you, yeah. what they thank you for? They said, you know what? It was a bad fit. Uh, I, I would never have identified it. Obviously I was unhappy with the outcome at the time, but now they've found a real success in their career that I think they needed that kick in the butt in order to find. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, but that said, I, you know, when I've terminated people, I don't, I don't ever expect to get a thank you. Letter. Yeah, that's a real nice surprise. Doesn't happen often. And then um, we've, had, we've had other ones where, you know, um, things weren't working out. And uh, the challenge I find as a manager is that is when to, where to invest your time. My philosophy has always been, you know, the first three to six months, every new hire deserves as much of my time as I can possibly give to, to help them succeed. And I think there's one case in particular I'm thinking where, you know, it, it was rocky to begin with. And it was not where I wanted to be spending my time, but ultimately it brought that person around. Have you come to a conclusion on how long to give someone before you realize this just is not going to change? You know, my, my personal take is usually three to six months. Um, although the thing that's most important in that time is actually having a focus as an organization, as a team, at giving that person every opportunity to be successful. I'm sure you've seen this all the time, but the, the toughest thing is when you're three months in and you say, this person is failing and you realize, like, well, we have not set that person up for success. Yep. We have not given them the mentorship or the projects. We have not answered their questions. And you can't expect change. Exactly. And it also kind of resets that clock. We're now, instead of being three months in, you realize we're really at zero with regard to that effort. So that's why uh, it can be hard to retain that focus. You know, there's so much stuff going on. Onboarding new employees, especially ones where it's hard rather than easy, yep. uh, it can be hard to retain that focus. 
Um, but that's the thing that I constantly remind myself of the negative consequences of that are that you're never going to feel comfortable terminating an employee when you feel like you have not done everything in your power to help that person succeed. Got it. I'm, I was surprised to hear you say, just to play devil's advocate, three to six months, it feels like a long time. You got a 15 person company. Every person needs to contribute and produce. And, and six months just feels like a long time. Well, like I said, it can be three to six. Uh, and six months certainly is a long time. Um, I would say that you know, both three and six are outliers. Uh, it's very hard to pull the trigger closer than that. You know, my expectation when people join is that they're, mo they're making significant contributions after a month or so. Not to right. say that they're not making contributions along the way, but that period between one and three or, or one and six months, um, you really can determine a lot about where they land. Now, it could be a total mishire, and maybe you see that a little earlier, or maybe you have a harder conversation four and a half months in and say, look, this person is net positive, but the opportunity cost of not being able to fill this rec with someone who could contribute more is too high. So um, it may not be that the person is a total, you know, a total disaster. Like it still could be that that person is contributing, but that um, they're not contributing at the level where you were, where you were hoping for. What have you found to be uh, the most effective sources at the top of the funnel to fill your pipeline with great candidates? I'm sure you're hiring developers in San Francisco, not an easy thing to do. Oh man, it is extremely hard in San Francisco, the epicenter of tech uh, with the big companies splashing around obscene salaries. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the best source is always referrals. Best source on both sides. You know, the easiest candidates to close are referrals, best candidates are referrals. Because if I have someone on the team, first of all, I, I know and trust that person. If they've worked with another person, then that is going to teach me a lot more than we normally get. Normally we get, you know, four, five, six, seven hours with the candidate total from yep. the first conversation to the last. So to get someone who has a larger body of experience with that candidate counts for a tremendous amount. Now that said, uh, going just from your network can also be a really dangerous thing in terms of creating a monoculture. You know, if, uh, you know my co-founder and I were very fortunate. We come from very different backgrounds from different companies we met at Sutter Hill Ventures rather than at some other job. But you see a lot of companies where it's some Facebook expats or some Google expats and they hire all of their friends who kind yeah. of have the same background. Now, Which is necessarily a good thing. It, it may be good early, but it gets very difficult in terms of uh, perhaps what you're alluding to. You've got uh, one way of thinking, so it's hard to break out of that box. And then when you try to bring in new candidates, it's hard for those new candidates to see themselves. You know, if I walk in and I say, hey, I'm not from Facebook. I'm not yeah. from Google. Uh, I think a little differently than you folks. It can be a little different. They feel like outsiders, right? Absolutely. And, and I think that, that obviously goes for, for background, but that also goes for cultural background, ethnic background, gender background. Like people want to walk in and see aspects of diversity across all of those different domains to understand how they're going to fit in, to see their, their peers and, and have it feel like a comfortable environment. Let's talk about, uh, before we wrap up, some of the nightmares. So what's the biggest mis hiring mistake you can think of? You don't have to name names, but what, what did you miss? What was the issue? And what did you learn from it and change your process going forward? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think that the one example of this is that uh, I lost kind of track of the interview process at one point in my last company and it drifted. And there used to be a particular type of screening question that we would ask and uh, it, it kind of drifted beyond the, the you know, what, what I had anticipated being. And it started being uh, a bad question. I'll describe that a bit. So what I want in, in kind of every interview question is potentially open-ended answers. Sure. I don't want to be... You don't want to lead the witness. Exactly. And, and part of the, re the reason leading the witness is so challenging is that it can be, uh, it, it can be it require inspiration or it can be a guessing game. It can be kind of a trick question. Trick, trick questions tell you more about whether that person has heard that question before. Sure. So um, it, it had drifted a bit where people weren't looking for any answer. They were looking for one specific answer. And as a result, I think we uh, excluded a bunch of really potentially great candidates because they had come up with alternate solutions, which were just as viable. How did you realize that had drifted and what did you do about it? 
Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I think that I, I checked in kind of uh, random times. I started hearing some weird signals and seeing some uh, confusing statements within the written feedback forms that we were using in the applicant tracking system that we had. Uh, and so I called a meeting with the person who was then responsible, who's kind of owning that process, uh, understood what had happened, and, uh, you know, had my own private moment where I vented my frustration in the utility closet and then got back, met with the broader team, and explained you know, how my expectations were a little different than what we've been executing and how we needed to change the process. Got it, got it. It is uh, so easy for these processes to come off the rails, especially as you're scaling, yeah. and you haven't taught your middle-level managers, or they don't know, or, or we assume they know how to interview, but many have never interviewed ever, right? right. So they make right. up questions almost as a form of entertainment for themselves as opposed to questions that have been proven to be predictive of a candidate's success. Yeah, I'll tell you, Jeff, my horror story on that is that when, I, when I joined a company at one point, I asked some folks, what, kind of, what question do you ask? And he told me the question. I said, oh, that's interesting. And I was like, what's the answer that you want? And he's like, well, it's something like this. And I was like, you know, that's wrong. You know, the, that, what you described is an incorrect answer to the question you asked. And I realized that everybody who had, past this screen had gotten that question wrong. It was like a negative filter. What a so shame. That was a real uh, eye-opening moment for me as well. Unbelievable. Well, I give you so much credit for starting a company, building a company, scaling it to 15 people. You're clearly well on your way, especially to your point, recruiting developers in San Francisco. Well, good luck with that. Um, and I appreciate you making the time. How can people learn more about the business or get in touch with you? Great question. Uh, so check us out at uh, www.transposit.com uh, or you can find us on Twitter at Transposit and send us a note. If you want to find me, I'm at AHL on Twitter uh, and, and hit me up. I'd love to talk about either what you're building in terms of applications or if I can help out with regard to hiring tips, especially developers in San Francisco. Uh, but I get the first crack at them. <laughs> I love it. Adam, thanks so much for making the time. Thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate it.